Today I'm going to talk about affirmative defenses for inchoate crimes, specifically attempt. Well, what are affirmative defenses? This is our first time really engaging them. Uh, affirmative defenses are where a burden is placed on the defendant uh, to show uh, that they have in fact uh, committed conduct that allows them to take advantage of these defenses so that they are not guilty. So in situations with affirmative defenses, the defendant has the act requirements committed, has the requisite mens rea, and nonetheless they will be found not guilty. Now at the end of this course, we're going to talk about general affirmative defenses that apply across all crimes or crimes, you know, almost all crimes with certain discrete limitations. Uh, but these uh, two affirmative defenses, ab abandonment and impossibility, uh, were associated with inchoate crimes, meaning the crimes that are incomplete. And so we'll talk about them here with attempt. We'll talk them again with conspiracy. Conspiracy is also an inchoate crime. Um, now, historically, we would say the burden that I was referring to a minute ago was both the burden of production, meaning offering evidence, and the burden of proof. Um, but it turns out self-defense is going to complicate this picture. But for these two defenses, it's what you should understand is the burden of proof is on the defendant by a preponderance of evidence, basically our civil standard, meaning the majority of evidence by just one scintilla over 50 percent um, has to favor uh, what is needed to prove uh, this defense. And, and therefore, the defendant would be not guilty on this. Now, we've spent a lot of time in this chapter dividing the common law and the MPC approach. When it comes to affirmative defenses, not going to do that. It's fair to just say some jurisdictions have an abandonment defense and some don't. Uh, for our purposes, we'll assume every MPC jurisdiction has a abandonment defense, even though in the real world, it's one of the least adopted parts of the model penal code. So the real world, a lot of jurisdictions don't have abandonment defenses, which we'll talk about why that's significant, uh, particularly for MPC jurisdictions. But for our purposes, we want to just focus on one rule. Um, so we're going to use the New Jersey statute as embodying the general abandonment rule. Um, because it turns out here, the model penal code didn't really deviate from the common law in substantial ways. Uh, they do for conspiracy. We'll talk about a conspiracy abandonment. But for attempt abandonment, it's pretty similar. And the key concept we want to focus on here is voluntariness. Now, I told you at the beginning of the semester, or early on in the semester, we were talking about act requirements. We were going to use the word voluntary three times, and each time it was going to mean something different. Voluntary acts, right? It was a very discreet way of trying to identify things where a defendant's not culpable uh, or and not legally responsible under criminal law for their conduct because the conduct was involuntary. And involuntariness was defined in a very particular way and that was one usage. We still have to get the voluntary manslaughter, which will be our third usage. But this is the second one, uh, which is when we're assessing voluntariness here, this is the closest to maybe what you're used to voluntary meaning, uh, which is, is it something of your own volition or will or intention? Uh, it's, you know, voluntary renunciation here of the criminal purpose, which is the way the New Jersey statute, you know, uh, uh, is written. And it's that language is from the model penal code. It means that a person through their own acts in their own mind without any outside coercion or third party intervention, um, they have decided not to go through with the crime. So what are some examples of things that are not voluntary? Well, the easiest one is if the police descend upon you. So you're about to commit a bank robbery. You walk into the bank. You're so conspicuous. They notice you right away. And the police just happen to be coming by. They draw their guns and you drop your gun and say, I voluntarily renounce my goal of robbing this bank. Well, for obvious reasons, that's a loophole we don't want to have in our criminal justice system, right? It's not voluntary at that point. It's only because the police have intervened that you have decided to change your mind. So we don't consider that voluntary renunciation. Otherwise, any educated criminal would instantly take advantage of that. So they're not liable for uh, attempt because they would have abandoned the crime. So third party intervention is one good example. Flight. Uh, or resistance by the victim for interpersonal crimes. It's another good example. So if you try to batter or assault somebody and they run away and they're just faster than you, um, you don't get to say, well, I, I'm giving up on this. I voluntarily renunciated and I've abandoned this crime. No, it was only because the person flew or perhaps they punched you or hit you or whatever. Any of that sort of resistance or flight will be 
that will will remove your abandonment argument. You won't have a viable claim there, and you should lose if you're allowed to uh, present it uh, to the jury. And so those are our sort of two big categories. In contrast, what is a voluntary renunciation? Well, the line here could be a little subtle, but there are cases that indicate, say, persuasion by the victim, uh, meaning sometimes the victim will cry or, you know, get like, don't do this to me. I'm, I, I have a family. I have, you know, I'm a good person. I do, you know, I take, I go feed the homeless on the weekend. And the defendant rethinks what they're going to do and says, you're right, I can't go through with this. And that's considered voluntary. Now I say there's a, there's a fine line here is because at some point we might think that crosses into the sort of um, uh, victim resistance, right? So if that speech about like, I have a family, don't do this to me, is coupled by a defendant, I mean, I'm sorry, a victim pushing the defendant away, well, then it's now we're in the world of involuntary abandonment and you don't get to use it. So it's really when it's solely persuasion and it's just words or emotions or expressions, things like that, they will create a voluntary abandonment. I mentioned this distinction because, of course, our, our case, first case here um, is, is, I think, close to this line and we can see it come out either way. So our defendant here in Koser, um, which I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but I'll stick with that for now, um, he is out and about looking for uh, to hire somebody for prostitution, right? That's not in dispute. That's what he claims. In this search, he finds a 14-year-old girl um, who he attempts to, you know, invite into his vehicle. Um, he doesn't act really strongly or aggressively here, um, but he does, you know, at least uh, suggest it more than once. Um, but the girl is, is so creeped out by him, she calls the police, and Koser is apprehended. Um, and he's identified by our underage minor here as um, the person who did approach him. Uh, and so the question is, when Koser, you know, was rebuffed and then drove away and continued his pursuit for a to hire a prostitute, um, had he abandoned his attempt? Well, first of all, let's just step back and say, well, is this even an attempt, right? Because this gives us a chance to review our act requirements and mens rea um, and think about, is it different under the common law here? Is he dangerously closed, right? Is it different than the model penal code? Well, let's save that discussion for class, but I do want you to think through that. Uh, mens rea, you know, similarly, is this an issue where um, he's trying to hire somebody who's underage? Because the statute here, attempted third degree criminal sexual conduct, requires the victim's age to be between 13 and 16. And so is mens rea. Uh, there's also potential questions. But for now, for the lecture portion of the course, uh, let's skip past that. I want to discuss those in class and just discuss the abandonment claim. Um, the court ultimately here doesn't think the defendant should even have an abandonment uh, instruction presented to the jurors. And I think that's a tough call, right? Uh, the district court allowed evidence of not only the defendant's prior convictions here, which has, you know, is an evidentiary issue, um, but they were used to show he's, he was targeting somebody who's underage. And so it wasn't like there wasn't you know, there was evidence on this issue of, of his intentions that he wanted to rebut, at least at the defense level, the affirmative defense level, and say, but listen, I drove away. That's abandonment. It's voluntary here. And this is, I think, a, a tough call. And I it's one of the reasons why um, I think this is a good teaching case. Um, you know, Koser argues, as the court says, there is insufficient evidence to support jury finding he was not entitled to an affirmative defense of abandonment. His defense, and then they state the Minnesota statute, an attempt is not voluntarily abandoned if the defendant refrains from completing the act because of intervening events. So the court here is sort of taking this third party intervention and, and referring to it instead as sort of intervening events. And then the court says, Koser claims that he immediately left when R.D., the person he approached, refused a ride because he realized he had made a mistake in thinking she was a prostitute because he did not want to scare her. Assuming as much that jury believed R.D.'s description of the encounter trial, it was R.D.'s repeated refusal that stopped Koser from completing the crime and not a voluntary and good faith abandonment by Koser upon realizing his mistake. So this is the really the the meat of the court's discussion here of a venom issue. And I, I want to say that this is not the most persuasive. Saying the jury believed her story when Koser didn't get to present his with a couple jury instruction on this particular issue, 
is significant. So that's one issue, right? That the jury never even got to heard how his uh, testimony about what happened fit within the framework of the law. But also, it's a little unclear whether or not repeated refusal is in that voluntary persuasion category or it's in the sort of resistance. And, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that this definitely, you know, could be voluntary, at least so it should go to the jurors, right? Because this is not, even if you reverse here, uh, it's not the same thing as saying Koser is not guilty. It's just saying instruct the jurors properly. And I do think this is a tough case. And, and what the intervening event here, it seems to be just the victim saying no, which is uh, an oddity. But, you know, this is the way lots of courts uh, treat abandonment because it is an infrequently applied defense. Many jurisdictions don't even have it. And those that have it, it's narrowly and rarely applied. So there you go. That's our first abandonment case. Um, let's look now. Let's go to our second, Baker. Baker, in fact, is, is more straightforward in some ways uh, here um, because we have an interaction. It, you might think back to our case of Fagan where we first talked about whether this was a force when somebody tugged uh, an item from somebody else. Uh, but it also is coupled with some, some, I don't know, quirky facts as well because our defendant here is trying to commit a theft, right? You know, they grab a woman from behind after she left work. Um, but we do have a couple odd things that are slightly different. One is we do have a third party here. A co-worker sees the commotion and the defendant walks away seemingly triggered by that. Um, but although Baker did try to grab the victim's purse, there is this strange moment uh, where uh, her key ring breaks off and falls to the ground and he picked it up and returned it to her, um, which in some ways is a stronger affirmative act of renunciation. In other words, he seems to be saying... I really don't want to do this, at least non-verbally. Um, and so how do we apply abandonment here, right? Because our defendant here didn't just seem to just say, I don't want to do this anymore. He actually seemed to take some curative measure, albeit not solving everything here. Um, but again, we see the court say, no, there, there's not enough for an abandonment defense here. Um, and I think the key fact is the coworker, right? The fact that the coworker is seen um, really means... Um, that we have a third party intervention, it's never going to be considered voluntary. We also do have more clear physical resistance uh, by our victim trying to hold on to our purse. So I think Baker in some ways is an easier case, but it also shows that even if a defendant tries to cure the harm they've caused, right? In other words, let's say they hit somebody and then they regret it and take it to the hospital, right? You've already completed the crime. It doesn't matter what curative actions you take there. This is an attempt, so you don't even have the injury or the physical theft yet. And nonetheless, that affirmative act, which seems strangely nice in that moment, given the horrific um, uh, events before it, well, yeah, that's, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as far as our law is concerned. Um, so that's our abandonment defense, right? Narrowly applied uh, in the jurisdictions that have it. Then we get to my least favorite topic in this course, impossibility. Why is it my least favorite topic? Well, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, I think everyone agrees that impossibility as a doctrine is incoherent, it is confused, it's a mess. Um, so why teach it? Well, historically there was one reason, which was the way the bar exam was in most states. Um, they focused on, as I mentioned before, 18th century common law, criminal law, and they liked impossibility questions, even though they were hard to answer and relied on applying a test that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's less true now, particularly in, uh, in Kansas and Missouri, two states where uh, a lot of uh, my graduates go. So um, now, those two states now use the UBE or the Uniform Bar Exam. Um, and it is not focused, or it has not been focused on 18th century common law criminal law. Instead, it focuses more on the model penal code um, and other modern statutes, which is one of the reasons why I mentioned the model penal code as an entity, even though it's not technically binding anywhere. So, um, yeah, it's just a, a shift. Uh, but it still does exist in some jurisdictions. But I, I want to give you the basic distinction and then explain briefly why um, trying to figure anything out beyond that is, is not a good task for anyone, any lawyer, any judge. Um, and then just sort of summarize what happens um, in our, our Michigan case here. So yeah, the house of nonsense. So our basic rule is if something's considered to be legal impossibility, it's a defense in some jurisdictions, a, a minority of jurisdictions under the common law. 
the NPC did not recognize impossibility as defense, and I'll, I'll touch back on that at the end. So the NPC, no impossibility defense, because they thought it was nonsensical. But a minority of common law jurisdictions still have it around. If your uh, argument is considered to be factual impossibility, well, then it's not a defense. So you might be thinking, like, mistakes of law, mistakes of fact. Yeah, I think that's where this doctrine emerged, having this legal versus factual distinction. But the simple fact is there's no um, consistent clear distinction between those two categories in terms of whether a case falls in one or the other. Um, you'll often see, you know, a lot of analogies drawn. In particular, there's a, a famous hypothetical that's talked about where somebody shoots a stuffed deer out of season versus, say, somebody shoots an empty bed where they thought a person was in. Um, the courts say the first one is legal impossibility, and so you're free to go. The, the second one is factual impossibility, so no, you don't get the defense at all. Um, but in truth, I can go through an exercise and show you that those two examples, there's really no difference between them. And what it amounts to in reality is sympathetic defendants in these common law jurisdictions that have the defense sometimes are allowed to argue impossibility. And unsympathetic ones never are. And that's, you know, it's not the, the black letter law you're hoping for. And I won't ever test a problem that has impossibility as its issue for this reason, because it's just not right. You might already be thinking back to a case that we looked at under mens rea attempt where the uh, California versus Hannah, where the defendant was charged with having um, or trying to commit a lewd act with somebody underage. Uh, and there, in fact, was no one underage in the other end of this online communication uh, created through a MySpace account um, because, in fact, it was really the dad who is older. Some people would, in fact, some defendants in these sorts of cases with these online stings, so it wasn't always the dad, it was actually police or another group uh, engaging these conversations. Some defendants tried to say, well, it's an impossible. I could never have completed the crime. And courts rejected that across the board and said, oh, no, that's factual impossibility. Um, but there's not really a sound reason here. And look at this Michigan case just to illustrate how muddled and ridiculous the doctrine is. Not only do the court, none of the judges here really defend the doctrine, right? Everyone's kind of of the mind that, well, yeah, it may not make the most sense, but it's there. But they can't even agree. They cannot even agree amongst themselves whether or not Michigan has ever adopted it um, and whether or not it's in any case law. Uh, because these sorts of things come up rarely. But I do want to highlight one thing. And so the court draws a lot from Joshua Dressler's Understanding Criminal Law Book, which is one of the few supplements I recommend. And he also says that this doctrine makes no sense. Um, but I don't like the way they characterize one part of what he refers to. And it's what they call pure legal impossibility, because this is something that often confuses students. Um, it's pure legal impossibility is what they're referring to is when a defendant commits what they think is a crime, but it's not a crime at all. So let's imagine you've you've heard so many anti-smoking, anti-tobacco messages that you've concluded that smoking a cigarette is illegal and it's a crime, and that if you get caught, uh, you will face like, 10 years in prison. Now, we know this is wrong, but you in your head think it is. Can you be charged with the crime of smoking a cigarette? No. But we don't want to call that pure legal impossibility because that can just confuse you. The simple fact is, there's just no act requirements that criminalize your conduct. In other words, there's no statute on the books that punishes you or criminalizes what you've done. And so what we mean by pure legal impossibility is really, or what the court means, and that's why I don't want you to use this phrase, is not that there's an affirmative defense, right? It's not as though we'd say you've met the act requirements, you've met the mens rea, but you're not guilty because of impossibility. No, we just say there's no crime, right? There's no act requirements that list conduct you've committed as criminal. And so pure legal impossibility is just sort of a uh, red hairy label. It will mislead you, it will confuse you, it will distract you. What you really just want to say is it's not a crime. And this is what the MPC drafters focused on. It's the cases where um, you think impossibility is an issue are really about act requirements. Um, they're really just about the, the, the crime couldn't have been committed or uh, ever possibly. And you resolve it from that standpoint. This is often really easy to identify in common law mens rea problems. So in the common law, I mean, sorry, common law attempt problems. So in common law attempt, you have to be dangerously close to the completion of an act. So there was this California case uh, using the common law attempt rule where a uh, undercover officer was engaged in a sting operation trying to get a defendant to, you know, uh, buy and sell cocaine. And it turns out our defendant here uh, 
also mentions to our undercover officer that they want to kill his wife, or he wants to kill his wife. Um, and so he asks, can you hook me up with a hitman and somebody can hire? So the undercover officer gets another undercover officer to be a hitman. And uh, they go through it. Our defendant gives a picture, uh, gives, uh, takes out insurance policy, says where his wife will be, and they charge him with attempted homicide. And, you know, one way if they get a case would say, well, it's impossible because there were two undercover agents. The crime was never going to be committed. But that's not the way the case was resolved. The conviction for attempted homicide was overturned. But it's because the defendant was never dangerously close or very near the completion of the crime because there were no officers. I mean, there were no actual hitmen here. These were officers. So on the one hand, you might be confused. Hold on, somebody can do that and not be guilty of attempted homicide? Well, this is actually why we have a different inchoate crime called solicitation. So the defendant was guilty of solicitation there, but that's not how the prosecutor charged it. And California has since amended their statutes to help deal with this. This case is actually from the 70s. Um, but it, you also might just be like, but but why, why isn't – no, no, very near dangerously close means you don't have to get to impossibility. You don't have to ever think that word. That case is resolved in the defendant's favor just at the act requirement level. Now, I've confused things a bit because it is a confusing doctrine. The model penal code drafters – and so this is where I'm looping back to the MPC – did recognize something that you might think of impossibility that's also hard to fit perfectly in that act requirement resolution scenario. And this scenario is true both under the common law and under the MPC. And the example that's often used here, so I will use it because it was the one the MPC drafters used, which was the voodoo doll, right? So a voodoo doll is kind of a weird concept in pop culture. It's, it's you know, derived from voodoo, which is a set of religious practices, but it's more just created its own mythos, which is a, a sort of doll in the image of somebody else that you could poke with pens or do horrible things to, and then a real person will experience those harms. Well, let's imagine one of you my students, has a voodoo doll of me and starts poking it, right? And at that point, we think, well, have you attempted battery? And at some point, you just get fed up with me and you cut off its head, right? So can we charge you with attempted homicide there? If not, is it because of impossibility? Well, what the MPC drafters said, and I think is right, but it's a little harder for students to sometimes wrap their head around, is that scenarios like that, um, they aren't attempts, even under the very government-friendly attempt rule because it's not strongly corroborative of the criminal purpose. In other words, a voodoo doll under no circumstances can ever kill somebody. It defies uh, the rules of physics, reality, uh, cause and effect. And so in that circumstance, your acts, your substantial steps is the, the attempt rule that we use under the model penal code. It, it, they, they're not strongly corroborative of a criminal purpose, which was the language that I read from the top of the model penal code approach. But as I said, it's also true under the common law because we would just say you're never dangerously close or very near, right? Because that voodoo doll isn't going to create harm with me. So even in that situation that some people say is a sort of impossibility defense, don't think of it that way. Just think it's the act requirements aren't met or the MPC sort of bleeds it over into mens rea because that's technically where it talks, you know, they don't d cleanly divide their discussion of um, act and mens rea. And when it says strongly corroborative of a criminal purpose, they're starting to use mens rea language. But it's just saying the act isn't there. The act isn't there and the voodoo doll cannot kill anyone. That doesn't mean all non-lethal weapons, you know, get you out of an attempt crime. So if you go rob a bank and you use a water gun that looks realistic, you can still be guilty of armed robbery because that appear, attempted armed robbery, because that weapon appears uh, to be real and it ha creates the same threatening environment. Uh, but if I try to shoot you with a water gun in a totally separate scenario, I can't be charged with attempted homicide, believing that you're, say, the Wicked Witch of the West from Wizard of Oz. So impossibility is more confusing than helpful. Um, but I at least want to give you the lay of the land, the basics here. And just in the real world, it almost never comes up. And if you think it's come up, really just go back to act requirements and you resolve the case better. Trying to focus on these weird scenarios uh, and that are the courts try to discuss when no scholars support this distinction anymore. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's it for our affirmative defenses. Abandonment is a minority rule, 
but it can apply in certain fact patterns and unique situations. Uh, impossibility is a mess, and you've learned a little bit about it, but you should probably never learn any more. Uh, so that's it for today.